This is Lecture 1 for Chapter 9, Byzantium. I want to begin by doing a quick review of um, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. Um, first governed by kings, then as a senatorial republic, called the Roman Republic, Rome finally became an empire at the end of the first century BC under Augustus and his authoritarian successors. The Roman Empire had its center in the Mediterranean Sea, controlling all the countries on its shores. The northern border was marked by the Rhine and Danube rivers. Under Emperor Trajan in the 2nd century AD, the empire reached its maximum expansion, controlling approximately 2.3 million square miles of land surface, including Great Britain, Romania, and parts of Mesopotamia. A period of peace, civilization, and an efficient centralized government in the subject territories ended in the 3rd century AD when a series of civil wars undermined Rome's economic and social strength. In the 4th century, the emperors Diocletian and Constantine were able to slow down the process of decline by splitting the empire into a western part with a capital in Rome and an eastern part with the capital in Byzantium, or Constantinople, which we now call Istanbul. Whereas Diocletian severely persecuted Christianity, Constantine declared an official end to state-sponsored persecution of Christians in 313 with the Edict of Milan, thus setting the stage for the church to become the state church of the Roman Empire in about 380. In 324, when Constantine founded Constantinople, or Constantine City, on the site of ancient Byzantium, he legitimately could claim to be ruler of a united Roman Empire. But when Theodosius I died, he divided the empire between his sons. Arcadius, the elder brother, became emperor of the east, and Honorius, emperor of the west. Arcadius ruled from Constantinople. After the sack of Rome in 410, Honorius moved the western capital to Milan and later to Ravenna. Though not formally codified, Theodosius' division of the empire became permanent. Centralized government soon disintegrated in the western half and gave way to warring kingdoms. The Roman Empire had been repeatedly attacked by invading armies from northern Europe, and in 476 Rome finally fell. Romulus Augustus, the last emperor of the Western Roman Empire, surrendered to the Germanic king Odoacer. Why Rome fell remains one of the greatest historical questions and has a tradition rich in scholarly interest. Many scholars maintain that rather than a fall, the changes can more accurately be described as a complex transformation. Over time, many theories have been proposed on why the empire fell, or whether indeed it fell at all. But Roman authority in the western part of the empire collapsed, and the western provinces soon were to be dominated by three great powers. The Franks in Francia, which is, um, you can see, in orange here. Um, the Visigothic kingdom in the Iberian Peninsula, Peninsula in purple here, and the Ostrogothic kingdom uh, that you can see here in pink that went into Italy and parts of the Balkans. The eastern half of the Roman Empire only loosely connected by religion to the west, and with only minor territorial holdings there, had a long and complex history of its own. Centered at Constantinople, dubbed the New Rome, the Eastern Christian Empire remained a cultural and political entity for a millennium until the, until the last of a long line of Eastern Roman emperors died at Constantinople in 1453, defending the city in vain against the Ottoman Turks. Historians refer to that Eastern Christian Roman Empire as Byzantium, employing Constantinople's original name and use the term Byzantine to identify whatever pertains to Byzantium, its territory, its history, and its culture. 
The Byzantine emperors, however, did not use the term to define themselves. They called their empire Rome and themselves Romans. Though they spoke Greek and not Latin, the Eastern Roman emperors never relinquished their claim as the legitimate successors to the ancient Roman emperors. During the long course of its history, Byzantium was the Christian buffer against the expansion of Islam into Central and Northern Europe and its cultural influence was felt repeatedly in Europe throughout the Middle Ages. Byzantium Christianized the Slavic peoples of the Balkans and of Russia, giving them its orthodox religion and alphabet, its literary culture, and its art and architecture. Byzantium's collapse in 1453 brought the Ottoman Empire into Europe as far as the Danube River, but Constantinople's fall had an impact even farther to the west. The westward flight of Byzantine scholars from Rome from the Rome of the East, introduced the study of classical Greek to Italy and helped inspire there the new consciousness of antiquity historians now call the Renaissance. Historians and art historians alike regard the reign of the Emperor Justinian as Byzantium's first golden age, during which the Christian Roman Empire briefly rivaled the old Roman Empire in power and extent. Justinian's generals, Be Belisarius and Narses, drove the Ostrogoths out of Italy, expelled the Vandals from the African provinces, beat back the Bulgars on the northern frontier, and held the Sassanians at bay on the eastern borders. At home, the emperor put down a dangerous rebellion in 532 of political and religious factions in the city, the Nica Revolt, and supervised the codification of Roman law in a great work known as the Code of Civil Law, which became the foundation of the law systems of many modern European nations. Justinian could claim, with considerable justification, to have revived the glory of old Rome in new Rome. At the beginning of the 4th century, Constantine recognized Christianity and became its first imperial sponsor. By the end of the century, Theodosius had established Christianity as the Roman Empire's official religion. It was Justinian, however, who proclaimed Christianity the empire's only lawful religion, specifically the Orthodox Christian doctrine. Justinian considered it his first duty not only to stamp out the few surviving polytheistic cults, but also to crush all those who professed any Christian doctrine other than the Orthodox. The emperor's most important project was the construction of Hagia Sophia, the Church of Holy Wisdom, in Constantinople. Anthemius of Tralles and Isidorus of Miletus a mathematician and a physicist, designed and built the church for Justinian between 532 and 537. They began work immediately after fire destroyed an earlier church on the site during the Nica riot in January 532. Justinian intended the new church to rival all other churches ever built and even to surpass in scale and magnificence the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem. The result was Byzantium's grandest building, buildings and one of the supreme accomplishments of world architecture. Hagia Sophia's dimensions are formidable for any structure not made of steel. In plan, it is about 270 feet long and 240 feet wide. The dome is 108 feet in diameter and its crown rises some 180 feet above the pavement. In scale, Hagia Sophia rivals the architectural wonders of Rome, including the Pantheon, the Baths of Caracalla, and the Basilica of Constantine. The exterior view in exterior view, the great dome dominates the structure, but the building's external aspects today are much changed from their original appearance. The huge buttresses are later additions to the Justinian design, and after the Ottoman conquest of 1453, when Hagia Sophia became a mosque, 
the Turks constructed four towering minarets at the corners of the former church. The building is now a museum. The characteristic plainness and unpretentiousness of the exterior scarcely prepares visitors for the building's interior. The feature that distinguishes Hagia Sophia from equally, la from equally lavish um, Roman buildings such as the Pantheon is the special mystical quality of the light flooding the interior. The soaring canopy-like dome that dominates the inside as well as the outside of the church rides on a halo of light from windows in the dome's base. Visitors to Hagia Sophia from Justinian's time to today have been struck by the light within the church and its effect on the human spirit. The 40 windows at the base of the dome create the illusion the dome rests on the light pouring through them. Thus, Hagia Sophia has a vastness of space shot through with light and a central dome that appears to be supported by the light it admits. Light is the mystic element. Light that glitters in the mosaics, shines forth from the marbles, and pervades and defines space that escapes definition. Light seems to dissolve material substance and transform it into an abstract spiritual vision. Pseudo Dionysius, perhaps the most influential mystic philosopher of the age, wrote in the Divine Names, Light comes from the good, and light is the visual image of God. Perhaps the most characteristic feature of Byzantine architecture is the placement of a dome, which is circular at its base, over a square, as in, um, we, as, as in what we see in Hagia Sophia. Two structural devices that are hallmarks of Byzantine engineering made this feat possible, pendentives and squinches. In pendentive construction, a dome rests on what is in effect a second larger dome. The builders omit the top portion and four segments around the rim of the larger dome, producing four curved triangles, or pendentives. The pendentives join to form a ring and four arches whose planes bound a square. The pendentives and arches transfer the weight of the dome not to the walls, but to the four piers from which the arches spring. The first use of pendentives on a monumental scale was in Hagia Sophia, although Mesopotamian architects had experimented with them earlier. In Roman and early Christian central plan buildings such as the Pantheon and Santa Constanza, the domes spring directly from the circular top of a cylinder. The pendentive system is a dynamic solution to the problem of setting a round dome over a square, making possible a union of centralized and longitudinal or basilican structures. A similar effect can be made um, using squinches, which are arches, corbels, or lintels that bridge the corners of the square um, supporting the walls to form an octagon inscribed within a square. To achieve even greater height, a builder can rest a dome on a cylindrical drum that in turn rests on either pendentives or squinches, but the principle of supporting a dome over a square is the same. To achieve this illusion of a floating dome of heaven, Anthemius and Isidorus, you can see here, used pendentives. To transfer the weight from the great dome to the piers, the big square piers um, in the corners beneath, rather than to the walls. With pendentives, not only could the space beneath the dome be unobstructed, but scores of windows could also puncture the walls. The pendentives created the impression of a dome suspended above, not held up by walls. By placing a hemispherical dome on a square base instead of on a circular base, as in the Pantheon, Anthemius and Isidorus succeeded in fusing two previously independent and seemingly mutually exclusive architectural traditions. The vertically oriented central plan building and the longitudinally oriented basilica. So here's the central, sort of the vertical central plan building and 
the longitudinal basilica structure. Hagia Sophia is, in essence, a domed basilica, a uniquely successful conclusion to several centuries of experimentation in Christian church architecture. However, the thrust of the pendent of construction at Hagia Sophia made external buttresses necessary, as well as huge internal northern and southern wall piers and eastern and western half domes. The semi-domes thrust descend, in turn, into still smaller half-domes surmounting columned exedrae that give a curving flow to the design. Let's just revisit the idea of central plan and basilican churches for a moment. Um, we saw in um, this building, Santa Constanza in Rome, which was built originally as a mausoleum, but then became a, a church in late antiquity, a centrally planned design, meaning it all focuses on the center of the church, um, and, and there is a raised dome above with um, clear story windows above that central space, an ambulatory to walk around the, um, the altar area was also part of that central plan design. Um, we mentioned the Pantheon um, as an early sort of inspiration for those central plan churches. Um, and then you can see the plan of Santa Constanza here. What we see from above uh, is this sort of series of, of concentric circles uh, that you with the altar space in the middle and then a series of um, arched columns and then a walking area, and then the exterior columned area. Now, a basilica plan is based on the Roman Forum, um, or the the basilica and the Rome as part of the Roman Forum, and it's just a big rectangular box. Um, when the Christians started building their first churches, they added a transept, that crossing piece, um, but it's but it's a much longer and it's it's called longitudinally oriented you enter at one end and you walk down the length and the apse with the altar is at the other end opposite the entry point so when we look at Hagia Sophia again we can really see that it is a combination of that centrally planned style and the basilica style of church and then when you look at the interior space, you can see that uh, there are these diverse types of ornamentation and columns and layers that are created in front of the underlying structure. And we must think that these diverse vistas and screen-like ornamented surfaces are, were intended to mask the structural lines. The columnar arcades of the nave and second story galleries have no real structural function. Like the walls they pierce, they are only part of a fragile fill between the huge piers. Structurally, although Hagia Sophia may seem Roman in its great scale and majesty, the organization of its masses is not Roman at all. The very fact the walls in Hagia Sophia are concealed and barely adequate um, um, Piers indicates the architects sought Roman monumentality as an effect and did not design the building according to Roman principles. Using brick in place of concrete was a further departure from Roman practice and marks Byzantine architecture as a distinctive structural style. Hagia Sophia's eight great supporting piers are ashlar masonry, which means they're done in, in rows, like, like you'd put bricks or, or concrete blocks together. But the screen walls are brick, as are the vaults of the aisles and galleries and the dome and semicircular half domes. So those are the, the screening pier, the screens of the columnar um, arcades, and though this is one of those great piers.
the ingenious design of Hagia Sophia provided the illumination and the setting for the solemn liturgy of the Orthodox faith. The large windows along the rim of the great dome poured light down upon the interior's jeweled splendor, where priests staged sacred spectacle. Sung by clerical choirs, the Orthodox equivalent of the Latin Mass celebrated the sacrament of the Eucharist at the altar in the apsidal sanctuary in spiritual reenactment of Jesus' crucifixion. At Hagia Sophia, the intricate logic of Greek theology, the ambitious scale of Rome, the vaulting traditions of Mesopotamia, and the mysticism of Eastern Christianity combine to create a monument that is at once a summation of antiquity and a positive assertion of the triumph of Christian faith. Now let's look at Ravenna. In 493, Theodoric, the Ostrogoth's greatest king, chose Ravenna, an Etruscan and later a Roman city near the Adriatic coast of Italy, south of Venice, as the capital of his kingdom, which encompassed much of the Balkans and all of Italy. During the short history of Theodoric's unfortunate successors, Ravenna's importance declined, but in 539, Justinian's general Belisarius captured the city, initiating an important new chapter in its history. Ravenna remained the Eastern Empire's foothold in Italy for two centuries until the Lombards and then the Franks overtook it. During Justinian's reign, Ravenna enjoyed great prosperity at a time when repeated sieges, conquests, and sackings threatened the eternal city of Rome with extinction. As the seat of Byzantine dominion in Italy, Ravenna and its culture became an extension of Constantinople. Its art, even more than that of the Byzantine capital, clearly reveals the transition from the early Christian to the Byzantine style. Construction of Ravenna's greatest shrine, San Vitale, began under Bishop Ecclesius shortly after Theodoric's death in 526. San Vitale is unlike any of the early Christian churches of Ravenna. It is not a basilica, rather it is, a centrally, it is centrally planned like Justinian's churches in Constantinople, and it seems in fact to have been loosely modeled on the earlier church of Saints Sergius and Bacchus that were there in Ravenna. San Vitale's design features a dome-covered clear story, lit central space, defined by piers alternating with curved, columned exedrae, creating an integrate eight-leafed plan. The exedrae closely integrate the inner and outer spaces that otherwise would have existed simply side by side as independent units. The exterior's octagonal regularity is not readily apparent inside the centrally planned church. The design features two concentric, concentric octagons. The dome-covered inner octagon rises above the surrounding octagon to provide the interior with clear story lighting. Eight large rectilinear piers alternate with curved columned exedrae, pushing outward into the surrounding two-story ambulatory. A rich diversity of ever-changing perspectives greets visitors walking through the building. Arches looping over arches, curving and flattened spaces, and wall and vault shapes all seem to change constantly with the viewer's position. Light filtered through alabaster paned windows plays over the glittering mosaics and glowing marbles covering the building's complex surfaces, producing a sumptuous effect. San Vitale, dedicated by Bishop Maximanus in 547 in honor of St. Vitalis, who died a martyr at the hands of the Romans at Ravenna in the 2nd century, is the most spectacular building in that northern Italian outpost of the Byzantine Empire. The church is an unforgettable experience for all who have entered it and marveled at its intricate design and magnificent mosaics. The mosaics in San Vitale's choir and apse, like the building itself, must be regarded as one of the greatest achievements of Byzantine art. 
completed less than a decade after the Ostrogoths surrendered Ravenna, the apse and choir decorations form a unified composition whose theme is the holy ratification of the Emperor Justinian's right to rule. In the apse vault, Christ sits on the orb of the world at the time of his second coming. On the choir wall to the left of the apse mosaic appears Justinian. He stands on the Savior's right side. The two are united visually and symbolically by the imperial purple and by their halos. A dozen attendants accompany Justinian, paralleling Christ's twelve apostles. Thus the mosaic program underscores the dual political and religious roles of the Byzantine emperor. The laws of the church and the laws of the state, united in the laws of God, manifest themselves in the person of the emperor whose right to rule was God-given. In the 10th century and through the 12th, a number of monastic churches arose that are the flowers of Middle Byzantine architecture. They feature a brilliant, brilliant series of variations on the domed central plan. From the exterior, the typical later Byzantine church building is a domed cube, with the dome rising above the square on a kind of cylinder or drum. The churches are small, vertical, high-shouldered, and unlike earlier Byzantine buildings, have exterior wall surfaces decorated with vivid patterns, probably reflecting Islamic architecture. The Catholicon, seen here at Hosios Lucas in Greece, near ancient Delphi, dates to the early 11th century. It is one of two churches at the site, and it was built during the second half of the 10th century. It exemplifies church design during the second golden age of Byzantine art and architecture. Light stones framed by dark red bricks the so-called cloisonné technique, make up the walls. The interplay of arcuated or arch-shaped windows, projecting apses, and varying roof lines further enhances the surface dynamism. The plans of both Hosius Lucas churches show the form of a domed cross in a square with four equal length vaulted cross arms, the Greek cross. The dome of the smaller church of the Theotokos rests on pendentives. In the larger and later Catholicon, the architect placed the dome over an octagon inscribed within a square. The octagon was formed by squinches, which play the same role as pendentives in making the transition from a square base to a round dome, but create a different visual effect on the interior. This arrangement departs from the older designs, such as Santa Constanza's circular plan, San, Vit San Vitali's octagonal plan, and Hagia Sophia's dome on pendentives rising from a square. The Catholicon's complex core lies within two rectangles, the outermost one forming the exterior walls, thus in plan from the center out a circle, octagon, square, oblong series exhibits an intricate interrelationship that is at once complex and unified. The Middle Byzantine revival of church building and of figural, figural mosaics extended beyond the Greek-speaking East in the 10th to 12th centuries. In the early Byzantine period, Venice, about 80 miles north of Ravenna on the eastern coast of Italy, was a dependency of that Byzantine stronghold. In 751, Ravenna fell to the Lombards, who wrested control of most of northern Italy from Constantinople. Venice, however, became an independent power. Its doges, or dukes, enriched themselves and the city through seaborne commerce, serving as the crucial link between Byzantium and the West. Venice had obtained the relics of St. Mark from Alexandria in Egypt in 829, and the doges constructed the first Venetian shrine dedicated to the evangelist. 
Fire destroyed the chapel in 976, and the Venetians then built a second shrine on the site. But a grandiose new St. Mark's begun in 1063 by Doge Domenico Contrarini replaced it. The model for Contrarini's church was the Church of the Holy Apostles at Constantinople, built in Justinian's time. That shrine no longer exists, but its key elements were a cruciform plan with a central dome over the crossing and four other domes over the four equal arms of the Greek cross, as at St. Mark's, which we see here. Because of its importance to the city, the doges furnished the church's interior with costly altarpieces and other objects, and deposited there many of the treasures, including icons they brought back as booty from the sack of Constantinople in 1204. The interior of St. Mark's is, like its plan, Byzantine in effect. Light enters through a row of windows at the bases of all five domes, vividly illuminating a rich cycle of mosaics. Both Byzantine and local artists worked on St. Mark's mosaics over the course of several centuries. Most of the mosaics date to the 12th and 13th centuries. In the vast central dome, 80 feet above the floor and 42 feet in diameter, Christ ascends to heaven in the presence of the Virgin Mary and the Twelve Apostles. In the great arch framing the church crossing are mosaics of the crucifixion and resurrection and Christ's liberation from death, called Anastasis, of Adam and Eve, St. John the Baptist, and other biblical figures. The mosaics have explanatory labels in both Latin and Greek, reflecting Venice's position as the key link between Eastern and Western Christendom in the later Middle Ages. The insubstantial figures on the walls, vaults, and domes appear weightless, and they project no farther from their flat field than do the elegant Latin and Greek letters above them. Nothing here reflects on the world of matter, of solids, of light and shade, of perspective, space. Rather, the mosaics reveal the mysteries of the Christian faith. Matching Venetian success in the Western Mediterranean were the Normans, the northern French descendants of the Vikings, who, having driven the Arabs from Sicily, set up a powerful kingdom there. Though they were the enemies of Byzantium, the Normans, like the Venetians, assimilated Byzantine culture and even employed Byzantine artisans. They also incorporated in their monuments elements of the Islamic art of the Arabs they had defeated. The Normans' Palatine Chapel at Palermo, which you see here on the left, with its prismatic ceiling, a characteristic Muslim form, is one example of the rich interplay of Western Christian, Byzantine, and Islamic cultures in northern Sicily. So you can see the Islamic building on the right and the Norman Byzantine building on the left. The mosaics of the great Basilican Church of Monreal, not far from Palermo, are striking evidence of Byzantine influence. They rival those of St. Mark's in both quality and extent. One scholar has estimated the Monreal mosaics required more than 100 million glass and stone tesserae. The Norman king William II paid for the mosaics and the artists portrayed him twice in the church. The apse mosaics are especially impressive. The image of Christ as Pantocrator, or judge, is in the vault. In Byzantium, the Pantocrator's image usually appears in the main dome, but the Monreal church is a basilica, longitudinally planned in the Western tradition. The semi-dome of the apse, the only vault in the building, and its architectural focus was the logical choice for the most important element of the pictorial program. Below the Pantocrator, in rank and dignity, is the enthroned Theotokos, flanked by archangels and the twelve apostles, symmetrically arranged in balanced groups. Lower on the wall, and less elevated in the church hierarchy, are popes, bishops, and other saints. The artists observe the stern formalities of Byzantine style here, far from Constantinople. The Monreal mosaics, like those at St. Mark's in Venice and in the Palatine Chapel in Palermo, testify to the stature of Byzantium and of Byzantine art in medieval Italy.